All right, so this is part two of my talk, and I'm going to start again with the genetic concepts just because I think they're really important to understand. So the first genetic concept that I think is really relevant to understanding the domestication of dogs is genetic variation. In this context, you can have a large population, a parental population like on the left that we can imagine might be wolves. And then you can start selecting from among those a subset, and you may have a particular region in the genome where there's a difference in a nucleotide. In one wolf, it might have a C at this particular position in the genome, and another wolf might have a T. And if we grab a wolf puppy that has a C, then we have the trait, if a trait's encoded by that C that's different from the T. If we take a wolf puppy, then we have the C trait wolf puppy, and maybe that's an ideal puppy, maybe that's not, to start domestication with. But you can imagine if we take that C puppy and then that ends up working and then we breed the siblings together, there is no T in it. It was homozygous C. So now we end up with a subpopulation of wolves that don't have the T at all. That's what artificial selection is. We reduce the genetic variation by taking a subset of it. And that's why genetic variation in a population is very important. The health and the strength of a population is kind of a function of its genetic diversity. And that's why I'm always amused when people are talking about, like, you know, this race and that race of people. I'm like, you know, melting pot in America, the more the merrier, the better we are. We have all these alleles and all these genes. And so that's the same thing. The wolf population was a rich genetic pool to start selecting from in which we were able to pull out a population that became domesticated dogs. Genotype and phenotype, those dogs that were selected, <clears throat> they still needed to be handled and interacted with. They weren't just taken and, you know, never again and none of their descendants ever interacting with humans. And the environment matters. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a little later some examples of some of the genetic changes that were selected for when humans domesticated dogs. But genotype and environment, those two things are intertwined. I get asked all the time, well, do you think that's genetic or do you think that's nature or do you think that's nurture? It's one thing. I don't, I, I, it, it's, there's not two things. There's one thing. You have this biological system that has a set of instructions encoded in its genome on what to do in a variety of environments. That's all you have. So in environment A, if there's a genetic program that can turn on in environment A, that program will turn on. And if you have program environment B, that'll turn on another program. And so the genotype and the environment gives a wide range of variation in phenotypes. And that's something that's really important, and that's, I think, overlooked a lot by people when they think about genetics. So remember, genotype plus environment equals phenotype. Genetic selection, uh, when we select for a particular trait, if we have a, a polymorphic region like a SNP, and that A is associated with this top animal that's got a very different appearance from the bottom one, and this is the region of the genome, and this is the one nucleotide that's responsible for the observable difference, if we take the G allele, we're going to end up with a population that looks like this. And if we take the A allele, we're going to end up with a population that looks like the top animal. Now, a lot of times what people do is they want to compare to understand what was selected for in an artificial selection context. We might say, well, we don't know what was selected, but we have this one animal. Let's just say it's this top one. And we could sequence its genome and see where there's regions of no variation. Because this top animal only has the A in our subpopulation, no matter how many of these animals we sequence, barring spontaneous mutation, we're only going to see the A. And then we'll go back to the parental population and say, oh, at that position we see A and G, so maybe it was possible that we lost genetic variation during the bottlenecking event of selecting the top animal. And we use that in experimental designs as a scientific way of trying to guesstimate what was selected for or which regions of the, of the genome exhibit evidence of selection or footprints of selection. So that's a very important point. Think like when you see this A and G, you can even imagine it that this gene, there might be an A and a G and within the parental population maybe this T could be an A and this G could be a C and a T. So a lot of variation. And when you see that variation disappear in a breed compared to all dogs or in dogs compared to wolves, that's evidence that that was selection because we removed all the variation and just selected a subset of the variation. And 
So in a, in a case control design, it's usually used with diseases, but you can take wolves in one context and domestic dogs in another context. Any two groups of individuals you could partition into a, a case and a control or something that you could say it has this trait, does not have that trait. You can try and sequence the genomes and see if you can find allelic variation that correlates with the trait, and that's a genetic association study. So those are used a lot in breeds and also between breeds to try and identify genes of interest in the dog genome. Gene expression. This is really important because one of the places where gene expression is probably plays the largest role in all of biology, I believe, is probably in neurobiology. Um, the brain is one of the most dynamic organs in the body. It's super complex. I mean, if you think about it, the human brain basically is like the most complex thing we know in the universe, and it fits in our skull. That's like amazing. Dog brain is not too different from a human brain comparing to all the other things in the universe like sand and marbles and glass, right? So if you have billions and billions of cells in the brain and you have thousands of genes expressed in each cell and then you have an experience and then the brain can go, whoa, in this region of the brain, turn these genes on, turn these two up. I want you guys to imagine a graphic equalizer <clears throat> where you have all these dials and you're adjusting the, the EQ on something with like 20, 50 bands. The genome has 25,000 bands on its EQ, and it can move them up and down. You have an almost unlimited number of combinations of ways to tweak the system. So you can have a neuron that's like, oh, I should fire a tenth of a second quicker in this condition. Turn these three genes on, shut off this voltage-gated channel, turn this up, increase the myelin here. Those are all changes at the genetic level that are occurring based on experience in the environment. So one of the things people can do is you can look at the brains of wolves and the brains of dogs, and you can ask, OK, if I look at 10 wolves and I look at 10 dogs, are there regions of the brain that have different levels of gene expression between the domesticated dog and the wolf? And if I do see differences, are, there, and are those in regions of the brain that have roles that we know what they do? For example, they affect emotion, or do they affect learning and memory? Are they associated with communication? So this is another genetic concept that's really important, and it's something that's used in trying to deduce how dogs were descended from wolves, and have given us a little bit of insight into how the human-animal bond was created during domestication of dogs. Reproduction is really important because we have this recombination or crossover. So let's say that this is a paternal, like a grandfather's gene, and this is a grandmother's gene, and then you ended up with, like, I have my maternal grandmother and my, and my maternal grandfather. So the the, gene, the copy of the chromosome I got from my mom is a single chromosome that has part of her father and part of her mother's chromosome one kind of stitched together. Like if you imagine a long string and it's like blue, red, blue, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue, red, like that. So because of that, we can get traits that were not in a single individual can now be in, in, in me because we can put things that were not in the same person. We could put those two markers, those two genes, in the same chromosome in the same individual. So when you have selective breeding, and artificial selection, and you're trying to do cross to get traits that you desire, the very fact that sexual reproduction causes chromosomes to swap pieces with each other as part of the gamete formation, sperm and egg are going to have these chromosomes that are combined of the grandparents for the, for the um, child that's being born in the future. So that's really important. That plays a big role in artificial selection. And then inheritance. Some traits are recessive and some traits are dominant. Now this is relevant because if a trait is recessive, right, it, you need to have both little a's if you think of your Punnett square, big A. So if you have like a heterozygote, big A, little a, big A, little a, you do your chart, you have big A, big A, big A, little a, big A, little a, and two little a's. Some breeds of dog are fixed for a particular allele. That means they have no variation whatsoever. So if you think of a German Shepherd, the allele that's associated with brachycephaly, the short face of like a French bulldog, the German Shepherd nowhere in the population carries that allele. No one has produced a flat-faced German Shepherd. I'm not saying it's impossible, but what I'm saying when we say the allele is fixed, all of those dogs are going to produce those longer snout in the German Shepherd because they are... I don't know if it's recessive or dominant off the top of my head, but I'm just saying that when an allele is fixed, whether it's dominant or recessive is not really an issue because there's no other allele in the population. They can only pass that trait on. 
And that's why I, I stress that breeds, like the radiation of breeds during like the last 200 years was predominantly a morpho an exercise in, in morphological variation. And people are like, oh, you can make a dog that looks like this. We'll make one that looks like that. And a key thing to remember is that a breed is defined by a closed breeding pool. And so I don't know what a mixed breed dog is. If someone says this dog is 25% German Shepherd, I, that sentence is like nonsense because a German Shepherd is a breed that's defined by a bunch of anatomical traits and features. And if you have 25% German Shepherd, then you don't even have all of the pieces of what makes a German Shepherd. So that's not a German Shepherd. That's like not even, it doesn't make sense. So people always ask me like, what does it mean? My dog's 13% poodle. I'm like, it means it's 0% cat. That's what I always tell them. <laughs> <laughs> um, genetic bottleneck is important. So as I'm saying, like, you know, in a wolf population, you could have a lot of genetic diversity and then you kind of get one round of d domestication and maybe that's like for some kind of affiliation with humans and it gives humans the ability to have dogs that are fit for companionship and they fit well into like the social structure of humans. And then from that, we start doing this second radiation of selection where we start producing very short dogs, very big dogs, dogs with long hair and short hair and long snouts and short snouts. When you get to a breed, this is the genetic variation in a breed compared to dogs in general. And this is the genetic variation in dogs compared to wolves. So at each step, you're further reducing the genetic variation as you select for a homogenous group, not identical, not a clonal group, but a homogenous group sharing the same handful of alleles that you selected on, which were your breed defining traits. Whether they were size, snout length, and coat color, that's kind of like what made breed. And if uh, anyone doesn't believe me on the uh, what is 20% of a German Shepherd? Go to an AKC dog show for German Shepherds, and when they tell you you can't show your dog, be like, my breed test says he's 8% German Shepherd. See if they get you in. All right. So when and where were dogs domesticated? Uh, this is a complex problem that's been studied for a bit, um, and the rest of my talk is going to be uh, a review of the literature that other people have done. Most of this is not my work. Uh, I find it very interesting and I tried to summarize in a succinct manner that I, in a way that I could get across to a broad audience. And my attempt here is to try and give people a real context because I, I think the general conception is that, oh, you just got dogs not to be scared of humans. And it is so much cooler than that. Um, <clears throat> so dog domestication appears to have occurred in multiple places at different times. So when you see that um, they used 185 thousand marker genotyping array. That means they were looking at 185,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms across the genome. And in this study from 2015, they looked at 4,676 purebred dogs representing 160 breeds. And they identified certain geographical subsets of village dogs that appear to be derived almost exclusively from European origins while they also found dogs from Asia, India, and Egypt, and there's admixture. So it seems like this was something that happened concurrently at different places at different times. A uh, study in 2011 describes the discovery of a 33,000-year-old skeleton, partial skeleton, in the Altai Mountains of Siberia. Uh, this was excavated in 1975. And when they started looking at this, um, they, you know, the paper starts describing the similarities to dog and not, and some people think like maybe this is the beginning of domestication, maybe it's wolf. And what they find is that um, you could find fossils that go back even farther, like 300, 400,000 years, and they're distinct from these fossils that you find like within the last 30,000 years. So it looks um, like the, uh, the, the changes that are occurring anatomically during domestication are starting to, to show. So um, haplotypes are, so remember when we were looking at that genetic variation, you could have a G or a T. Imagine if you had two of those next to each other. So you had a, very, a SNP here and a SNP here. Well, if the SNP here could be A or G and the SNP here could be A or G, one haplotype is AG, an A at this position, a G at that position, another haplotype is G at this position, G at that position, another haplotype is A at this position. So a haplotype is a specific single strand of DNA 
and multiple variants as you, as you scan along it, that's a haplotype. So this is not correct, but you can think of it as like a genotype on just one copy of the DNA, but it's along a stretch of DNA. A haplotype is basically a way to cheat. You can think of it as a sequence of the DNA, but we only look at the regions that are variable, and we tell you what the, what the alleles are at the variable positions because the constant regions don't change. Okay, so analyzing haplotypes across ancient wolf samples, uh, at some samples that were 8,700 years old and 28,000 years old, some of those haplotypes are indistinguishable from haplotypes that are observed in geographically diverse breeds that exist today. So that suggests that if the dogs of today have those, then maybe these were their ancestors. So we're trying to put dates and times and places to the ancestors of our dog. And remember I talked in the previous session about the last common ancestor. So what we're trying to find is molecular evidence that the dogs of today came from some fossil or from some population of animals that lived so many years back. There's a haplotype that's observed in one 47,000 year old canid sample that was very distinct from the other wolf haplotypes. And it differed from current day haplotypes by just a handful of mutations. What that means is like, wow, in 50,000 years, you could have got two spontaneous SNPs and that would be what we see in dogs today. So they're using inference to try and say, that's pretty close to the genetic sequence we're seeing in dogs today. Not quite, but it's very different from wolf, but it's pretty close to dog, but it's not exactly dog. So um, the boxer genome was the first genome that was sequenced for dogs. And that genome was chosen because boxers are, were, ex boxers were anticipated to have less genetic diversity within the breed than other breeds. So when you are sequencing a genome and assembling a genome, What's the largest book you could think of? Or I don't know, let's say you had like uh, the, the largest newspaper or something. And imagine you just shred it into tiny pieces in a paper shredder. But you take 50 copies of the thing and you shred it in all different angles. That's what you get from DNA sequencing data. And then the way you assemble the genome is computationally. You take all the shreds and you try and line them up. You're like, the sun was shy. Then you see was shining. And so you line those two up and you assume they go together. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But when you do deep sequencing, you get, you get a lot more higher resolution coverage and you get um, more information. So the boxer genome was completed and a study looked at sequencing three gray wolves, each centered on a geographical region presumed to correspond to a geographical dog domestication site. Two basal dog lineages, the dingo and the Visenji, and the golden jackal and the public boxer. So they sequenced all of these and then they assumed um, one in 10 million mutation rate. So I told you that DNA replication is imperfect and you get mutations when DNA copies itself. And I also told you in the last session that time is kind of the measuring stick for genetics. So what you do is you assume a certain amount of mutation and then you can sequence things and you can kind of estimate, well, if we expect one change in every thousand nucleotides every 5,000 years, you can count how many differences you have and under your model, you can go, oh, well, maybe they had a common ancestor 25,000 years ago, or maybe they had a common ancestor 50,000 years ago. And, they, and this study uh, was used to produce a couple models of dog domestication. And um, these models are basically saying, this is the golden jackal. Uh, then you have the Croatian wolf. This is the boxer, um, the Israeli wolf, uh, the Basenji, the dingo, and the Chinese wolf. So just to, in general terms, explain this figure, <clears throat> this is time this way. So this is um, 398,000 years ago on the top left of this figure. And then the very bottom would be like today. And then where you see these horizontal connections, it means that this was one big population and it may have split. You could think of it like maybe the continents drifted and they could no longer interbreed and then Many thousands of years later, maybe people with ships crossed and let them breed again, just to give you an idea. And then each of these things coming out of this, is, so this might have been wolves. And the idea is that this is the model that's uh, believed to be the most correct one. And you can see like the golden jackal came out of a lineage of wolves that had very little interaction genetically or reproductively with these other things until relatively recently. And the boxer, Basenji and Dingo are all coming out of this lineage from these wolves. Now what's important about this is that the idea that I want to get across that I think is really important to understand is that 
all of the domesticated dogs we have today came out of this radiation from wolves because when we get to Boxer, this, these lines here, this is saying this is like, uh, <clears throat> these are like the numbers in here. So this is like the effective population size. So when you get down to Boxer, when you get down to these dogs, they all went through whatever events were used to get wolves domesticated, all breeds had it. So if someone's like, is this breed dangerous or is that? All these dogs were selected artificially for the same traits. And I'm gonna start telling you what genetics is telling us about those traits in a second, but I want you to understand that in this, this is a bottleneck. We talked about bottlenecks. So you have this diverse population of wolf genetics, and now you get a bottleneck that we get the domesticated dog coming out of. And there's some crossbreeding within these populations, but the main point is that that's an individual, <clears throat> excuse me, that's an individual bottleneck. So artificial selection in dogs. Here's a really cool example, and, and um, I talked a little bit in the previous session about amylase and starch. You know, we had an agricultural revolution in human in, uh, history about 10,000 years ago where we started producing agriculture and growing crops. And um, up here, this is what an enzyme is. An enzyme is something that can take a molecule that's green in this picture. It's called a substrate, and it can bind to an enzyme, and the enzyme can cause the bond between the two parts of the substrate to break apart, and then the enzyme will release it, and you've broken a more complex molecule into a smaller molecule. Amylase, or amylase 2B, breaks apart starch. <clears throat> Each of these little hexagons is a simple sugar, like a simple sugar like fructose. And starch is a branched chain complex carbohydrate. And amylase can break the bonds of starch to release the sugar, and the body uses sugar for energy. Now what's interesting is if you look at the domestication and artificial selection in dogs, in areas where agriculture started to flourish, dogs had, were selected that had multiple copies of amylase in their genome so that they could digest the components of the human diet. And this, this is showing how many copies of amylase are in the genome. And so you can get like Alaskan Malamute can have as little as one copy maybe or two and that you get a dog, so there wasn't much agriculture in Alaska. <clears throat> and then where the Pekingese and the Sharpe were produced, there was much more agriculture, so they were selected for dogs that were able to digest starch. And that's, that's evident in the genome of these dogs because how many copies of the gene they have. When chromosomes reproduce themselves, every once in a while they kind of just repeat a huge segment. And that's how you can get gene duplications. That's a normal part of evolution. It doesn't mean that the diet caused the genome to grow. It meant that randomly the dogs that had additional amylase enzymes were more fit to get nutrition from the human starch diet. And so those were the ones that would thrive and those are the ones that survive today. And they still carry the instructions to process starch into sugar encoded in their genome because it's genotype plus environment that creates phenotype. So I want to talk a little bit about gene ontology. Gene ontology sounds like a complicated term, but what people have done in bioinformatics to make sense of genetics, if we have 25,000 genes, I can't remember the names of all the genes. I, I don't know. It's hard. So what we do is we have controlled vocabulary, and we just put terms on genes. Like if you're like, oh, this is a muscle gene. This is a neurotransmitter receptor. This is involved in brain development. So there are databases that for any gene, we'll just have lists of terms that are human curated that are assigned to the gene to say this, it's involved in insulin production or it's in associated with starch metabolism or it's involved in liver biogenesis or any, any of that stuff. So gene ontology is a very powerful tool because if you, remember when I told you like you can look at a genome from a dog and say which regions don't have genetic variation compared to regions in the wolf? Then what you can do is you can say, okay, we found 100 regions in the dog genome that where there's no variation and in wolves there's a lot. The next thing you could do is you could use gene ontology to ask the question, is there any common biological function that this complete set of 100 genes shares? And with a little bit of math and a little bit of uh, this analysis and you'll get answers that are very like English readable, understandable. So the gene ontology enrichment is an analysis that identifies shared gene ontology terms that are associated with a set of genes. An example might be a study that identifies genes exhibiting no genetic variation in dogs compared to wolves. Imagine you find 25 genes in your analysis. 
Well, you take those genes and you put them into like this tool, and um, you might find out that um, they're enriched for certain terms like brain and neurotransmitter. Now, just to let you understand, it's not that you say there's 25 genes are at least 20 of them associated with brain. No, I want you to understand this. It's, it's, um, it's a hypergeometric distribution, which just means that it's combinatorics, which means like, let's say that you were at a baseball game, a New York Yankees baseball game. Would you expect to see a lot of New York Yankees jerseys like on the fans? Probably. But if you were just randomly somewhere else, if one out of six people had a New York jersey on, you'd be like, that's weird. Okay, another example would be like, let's say that there's a huge international meeting for medicine, and normally at the airport, there's people from all walks of life, and then on this one weekend, if you were to, if you were to ask people, one out of every three people was in the medical field, that's an example of enrichment. And what it really means is like, if there are 200 genes in the genome that are associated with neurotransmitter production, which there's many more, but I'm just saying like 200, and there's 25,000 genes in the genome, there's your lotto ticket. So let's say you found 25 genes. So you pick 25 numbers from the 25,000 choices on the lotto ticket, which is, you, we can't even win it with 50 numbers with six, choosing six. And if you got 20 out of 25 genes were involved in neurotransmitters, that would be a super high signal because there's only 200 in the genome and there might be like 100 billion ways to choose 25 genes from 25,000. So the point is, is that this is a rigorous mathematical method that will assign biological functions to genes based on the properties that the group of genes as a whole shares. So if we start asking how did dogs' brains change during domestication, what we find is that in one study in 2004, the mRNA expression levels of 7,700 genes were analyzed between the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the frontal lobe. And that was in wolves and coyotes and dogs. And in the first set of gene expression experiments, 156 genes were identified as having region-specific expression in all three species, meaning that those genes were in those regions. And then in a second set, 114 genes exhibited expression differences between the species within the brain region. So it might be this gene is really high in the amygdala in wolf, and it's off in dog. Or it's low in dog, but it's really high in wolf. And when they did the gene ontology analysis to find out what biological functions were associated with these genes, they found neurogenesis, which is production of brain cells or the production of the brain, cell-to-cell -cell communication, which is like neurotransmission, and again, the word neurotransmission. And these words are just placeholders. It's not just random. It's deeper than that. But it means that these were genes like, I'm making this up. I don't know off the top of my head, but like serotonin receptor, dopamine receptor, glutamate receptor, um, neurotransmitter biosynthetic enzymes. So when they ask which genes are most different between these regions of the brain, you know, we know the frontal lobe is involved in planning and thinking. We know the hypothalamus regulates some of the, um, some of like our flight or fight response. And we know the amygdala is a center that controls emotion. So when we find these genes that are different between the levels that they're on in wolves compared to domestic dogs, that's evidence that this, these genes were some of the things that were their expression levels were modified by genetic variations that control how high and how low these genes go in domesticated dog, and that they're very much related to neurobiology. So just as an example, this is a paper saying dopamine in the medial amygdala network mediates human bonding. And um, I'll just read the abstract parts of it. Research in humans and non-human animals indicates that social affiliation and particularly maternal bonding depends on reward circuitry. Although numerous mechanistic studies in rodents demonstrated that maternal bonding depends on striatal dopamine transmission, the neurochemistry supporting maternal behavior in humans has not been described. In this study, we tested the role of central dopamine in human bonding. We applied a combined functional MRI PET scanner to simultaneously probe mother's, do mother's dopamine responses to their infants and the connectivity between the nucleus accumbens the amygdala, and the medial prefrontal cortex, which form the intrinsic network that supports social functioning. So I'm showing this paper to show that the expression of genes in the amygdala does play a role in bonding, social networks. And I'm showing that the domestication of dogs is modulating gene expression in the same region of the brain that's implicated in social bonding. And I want to underscore that this is kind of in contrast to 
It's not just that we reduced the flight, the, the flight distance of dogs, we just got them not scared. We're actually creating bonds, strong emotional, neurobiological connections with our companion animals. So um, Lee et al. in 2013 assessed a population differentiation between Ch Chinese native dogs, gray wolves, and German shepherds, and he used about 50,000 genetic variants. Um, when he looked at the gene ontology, biological process enrichment, it revealed that 40, 42 genes were associated with behavior. Now, I want to stress that bottleneck that all domestic dogs came out of, all the dogs that we have today in breeds share this selection. I mean, it's possible that some of these could be German Shepherd specific, but a lot of this domestication occurred thousands of years ago before we had breeds, and sometimes a single breed is a good proxy for dogs in general. But the point is, is that since we're comparing them to wolves, it's not like we're comparing them to labs and to sharp haze and poodles. We're saying domesticated dog versus wolf, 42 genes were associated with behavior. And these are genes that exhibit less genetic variation in dogs compared to wolves. And the authors make the claim that artificial selection during the primary splitting of dogs from wolves, which is this, I'm just going to go up a bit, this, the primary splitting here, and then you can imagine that we have radiation of dog breeds down these purple legs as you start pulling out classes of dogs for the breeds that exploded in the last 200 years. The primary splitting, these people are saying, that the primary splitting of dogs from wolves was associated with rapid brain evolution. And furthermore, they connect the emergence of dog-specific behaviors during domestication with altered gene expression changes in their brains. A second study by Lee et al. compared the published resequenced genomes of three wolves and 10 dogs to an additional three wolves and Chinese dogs. And they found genes, these are like glutamate receptor interacting protein and GABA receptor. So they identified these neurological genes and, the, and these exhibited fixed alleles between dogs and wolves. And I told you fixed means that there is no other variant at that location within the population. So when it's fixed, it means no matter what you cross, there's no variation there. So we excluded a large variety of, uh, of allelic variation that was present in the wolf population from the dogs. So all companion dogs have undergone this selection at the neurological level for affiliation and social bonding with humans. Gene ontology enrichment identified significantly enriched terms of Adenylate cyclase inhibiting G protein receptor activity, um, glutamate receptor signaling. You know, glutamate is involved in learning and memory. Um, <clears throat> there's an NMDA receptor, which is a type of um, glutamate receptor. And the NMDA receptor is really interesting that, th like most neurotransmitter receptors, just open or close. This one can only open when a neuron is firing because it has an ion in it that blocks it from working. And when a neuron is already firing, that ion comes out, and then it gets stimulated by another neuron. So it's a coincidence detector. And so if, you don't, if this gene is mutated, there's significant deficiencies in memory. So they're saying that glutamate is the brain's main excitatory neurotransmitter, and it regulates behaviors, emotions, cognitive abilities, as well as learning and memory. So. <clears throat> I want to make the case that dogs were selected for not just reduced fear, but for a tremendously strong attachment to humans and a focus on humans more than just being around them. Um, <clears throat> so this is like the object choice test where food could be hidden somewhere like in B or A and then someone points. And chimpanzees aren't very good at this task. If you point, the chimpanzee doesn't really understand what you're doing. <clears throat> but with dogs, dogs can very easily pick up on human pointing gestures. And um, you can imagine that across many cultures, regardless of language spoken, gestures are probably pretty similar. Come here, go, you know, I love you. <laughs> so that would be a very common thing. And so if you're out with your dog doing something, you might, you might point to your dog. So dogs being able to respond to pointing we're probably, this is a really good dog. Oh, yeah, I could tell him things, and he listened. Well, cross that dog with this dog. My dog does this. The idea is that people were breeding dogs not just for reduced fear, but for ability to understand humans and almost be telepathic with humans in that we're pointing and we're touching things and we're using eye gestures, and the dogs are responding to that stuff. 
So the neuropeptide hormone oxytocin has a well-established role underlying social bonding in mammals. It mediates social relationships and social interactions. In humans, oxytocin coordinates parental responses after physical contact with offspring and interactions between sexual partners, interactions with friends, and empathetic interactions with strangers. So empathy is an important role in social bonding. <clears throat> so oxytocin increases trust in humans. And I'll just read the highlighted part. <clears throat> Here we show that intranasal administration of oxytocin causes substantial increase in trust among humans, thereby greatly increasing the benefits from social interactions. So I show this paper to understand the role of oxytocin in general in an organism that we can appreciate, which is Homo sapiens. And social reward requires coordinated activity of the nucleus accumbens and oxytocin and serotonin. So the neuropeptide oxytocin regulates parochial altruism and intergroup conflict among humans. <clears throat> so oxytocin drives a tend and defend response in that it promoted in-group trust and cooperation and defensive but not offensive aggression towards competing outgroups. <clears throat> so in 2014, <clears throat> uh, a study was done where they identified a pro-social role for oxytocin in dogs. The authors describe a study in which dogs were given either oxytocin or a placebo and were assessed for affiliation with either dog or human partners. The results demonstrated that dogs administered oxytocin exhibit greater affiliation towards their owners compared to placebo. <laughs> the results suggest that oxytocin facilitates pro-social interactions among dogs and humans. And they point out that their results are in line with studies in humans that demonstrate increased trust. This is the, uh, this is, uh, let me see. Um, oh, I want to say one other thing. <clears throat> oxytocin is something that plays a big role in maternal bonding with infants. And um, oxytocin is released when, um, when women feed children. And so this is a very strong evolutionary signal that connects socially, makes bonds. And so like the same relationship that a mother can have with her child Humans were literally selecting dogs for amplifying that across species. And I believe that is like the foundation of the human-animal bond and that the modulation of the neurotransmitters, the brain regions, the gene expression, all of that together is ultimately represented in all dogs that we consider companion animals, regardless of their breed. So it's possible that domesticated dogs were selected for more affiliative relationships with humans through allelic variation within genes mediating oxytocin receptor signaling. Existing allelic variation in oxytocin receptor among dogs has been associated with specific phenotypes. For example, Kiss et al. describe a study in which <clears throat> the oxytocin receptor variants in dogs uh, support this. Their study identified evidence that polymorphisms within the oxytocin receptor modulate human-directed social behavior. They genotyped 103 border collies and a single population of German shepherds and assessed behavioral phenotypes across five specific tests, greeting the dog, separation from owner, problem solving, threatening a stranger, and owner hiding from dog. The study results demonstrated evidence of an association between the G allele at position minus 212. That just means that if the gene starts here, it's upstream in the part of the gene that controls how much of the gene is made, that promoter region. And the study demonstrated evidence that, that um, proximity seeking in the dog breeds was associated with which version of the gene they had. So they would be more likely to be closer and pay more attention to humans. In 2015, another study investigated the physiological consequence of gazing behavior between dog and owner. And the rationale for this study was based on the idea that human-like modes of communication, such as mutual gaze, may have been selected in dogs during domestication by humans. The authors refer to maternal oxytocin levels rising in human mothers. In the first experiment, <clears throat> they measured oxytocin levels in the urine of dogs and owners during 30-minute interactions. And then the experiment was repeated with hand-raised wolves to assess whether an oxytocin loop may have been acquired during dog domestication or whether it's shared among canids that did not undergo domestication. This is actually an awesome paper. They did all the controls to work it out. It was really elegant, and it was really well written. 
And the results of the first experiment demonstrated that dog urine oxytocin levels rise when humans gaze at their dogs. And similarly, human urine oxytocin levels rise when dogs gaze at their owner. In contrast, wolves do not exhibit long periods of gazing. And the authors interpret this finding to mean that wolves do not ga engage in mutual gaze as a means of social communication. They also point out that in wolves, eye contact is considered a threat. So here we have this underlying neuropeptide hormone that mediates strong bonding in, hu in human families being involved in getting dogs to look at humans longer. And we got animals that could recognize humans pointing. So I really believe this is like the foundation of the human-animal bond. <clears throat> Uh, in 2016, uh, nine oxytocin receptor polymorphisms in four different canid species were investigated. Um, allele frequencies were assessed in 689 purebred dogs, beagles, border collies, German shepherds, golden retrievers. And across the dog breeds in wolf, they report that only two of the polymorphisms exhibited evidence of both alleles in border collie, golden retriever, lab, and everything. So. <clears throat> This allele, so these, the variance means that there's still some ability to select dogs on oxytocin phenotypes, but it's also saying that out of the nine polymorphisms they looked at, only two were present in all of these canids. So again, there is a selection on the oxytocin receptor, which has modulated how oxytocin works in the dog in relation to humans. So the take-home message is that given the phenotypic evidence provided by cognitive neuroscience, combined with the genetic evidence of phenotype-genotype relationships, it's plausible that artificial selection during dog domestication modulated neural circuitry in the dog, resulting in significant social and cognitive attachment to humans. Thus, the insight gained through genomics investigations into dog domestication offers strong evidence of canine domestication occurring through considerable artificial selection of canine brains and behavior more than simply reducing fear of humans. And in fact, I think that domestication of dogs created the first human-animal bond, and it's the strongest bond among all human-animal bonds. And I'd point out, uh, the bottleneck associated with domestication of dogs from wolves contribute to brain-associated changes that are shared among domestic dogs today. And that's why dogs do this, not wolves. Because dogs are connected to humans, and they respond to humans, and they're adaptable, and they're trainable, and they're bonded. And that's why they're called our best friend, because they are our best friend. That's not just a euphemism. That's really what it is. You don't go through 30,000 years of a very tight partnership and not come out good friends. And that partnership goes back quite a long ways. Thanks for your time. <laughs>